Well, to everyone who's joining us at home tonight, we are super thrilled to create this extra special VQA at home edition uh, for our terroir symposium. Um, VQA has been a long-term partner of ours and we have always been proud to have their support and support them and support the winemakers and, and wine growing region of, of Southern Ontario and other outstanding regions Prince Edward County and, and Erie uh, as well. So happy to have uh, Magdalena Kaiser, who happens to also be a friend and expert in wine, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and then also joined by Olivia Simpson and Ricky, uh, who are a sh young chef duo. We had them on our uh, symposium yesterday talking about um, the trials and tribulations and how to uh, pivot and cope as young chefs today. Uh, and still remain vi vibrant and innovative. So happy to have this session tonight. Super excited that we have so many people logged on to this and I'm hoping that you're going to get so much out of it. Uh, if you didn't get your PDFs, which we sent out a few times, uh, I'm happy to put them in the link as well. Um, but um, I'm gonna turn this over to Magdalena now who's going to introduce the session. And then um, we're gonna have a couple, um, an hour and a half of cooking, demoing and tasting wine. Thank you, Magda. Thank you very much, Arlene. Uh, that was, um, it's so great to see you finally. Um, yes, we're friends and um, hopefully I get to see you while you're back in Ontario. Um, so we are totally excited to be part of Terroir again. Uh, VQA Wines of Ontario has been uh, an important partner and you've been an important partner to us to help tell the story of local wine. And uh, this is actually, uh, we are also very thankful that you've um, worked with us to put this fourth edition of the VQA Live Chef Session. And we're really super excited to have Ricky and Olivia uh, here today. And I'm so excited. I, was with, I wish I was in your kitchen because I know all of the food that you're going to be making. And I am gonna be talking about the wine and I can't multitask. I have some ingredients here. I'm gonna to try to make a couple of things. But um, I, I know we're going to have, have an amazing night. I just uh, wanted to remind everybody that we are going to, uh, you know, for those of you that have been with us and have done these sessions in the past with Anna and Anna Olson and Michael Olson um, or uh, Chef Michael Pateran, you kind of know the format, but I'll just remind everybody kind of how we're doing this. What we did was we sent out a suggested list of, of wines, 12 wines, and uh, there are four different recipes or courses that Ricky and Olivia are going to make. So what we've done is we've really put three wines kind of clustered with each uh, food item that they're gonna make. So now of course you may have no wine. We hope that you do. We hope that you wanna purchase some of these wines. You might wanna taste one wine or you may look at the recipes later and, and see the pairings and, and go back to them. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll have uh, Ricky and Olivia work through these recipes and I'll just do a little introduction of the wines that we've kind of paired and interject and discuss those. And uh, of course, Rick and Olivia uh, are working out of Westcott um, Vineyards and they have their pop-up restaurant there. And so they're really connected to local wine and they're also gonna interject on their passionate favorites, of course. Uh, so that will be great. And so what we ask is if you do have questions during the session that you put them in the chat and Arlene is going to scan those for me and uh, text them to me so I can ask Ricky and Olivia those questions live, you know, sometimes cooking tips and so on. So you guys don't need to be worried about looking at your screen and looking for questions. And uh, we're happy to answer anything that we can. Of course, if we, we don't answer them today, we'll, we'll double check and, and certainly send us an email. Uh, please share all of this on social media as you may want to through our uh, at Wine Country Ontario um, at Wine Country Ontario Aunt uh, is our Instagram account. And of course we have Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, we know that for food and wine, Instagram seems to be one of the greatest, uh, most fun ways that people are using for that. So that's kind of the long winded intro here. And so Ricky, Olivia, I just want to refresh my, I'm looking at the list of recipes. So can you confirm that we're going to do it in this particular order? And then uh, maybe you guys can tell us kind of how you're going to run through these recipes so people can get, you know, 
ready in the kitchen. So are we going to do the Ontario Brie Saganaki first? Is that the plan in the order kind of? And then the PB and J duck liver pate, then roasted squash and then fillet of trout? Or is there a different um, format? Yep, no, that is the order we are going to go through, yeah. Okay, excellent. Right. So do you, uh, do you want to come back on maybe uh, the main screen here and then tell us maybe uh, get people understanding. Um, so you're going to start with the Ontario Brie Saganaki. Mm -hmm. So why don't you get started and maybe I'll talk about the wines in a couple of minutes, but just as a reminder for those of you that do have the wines or are looking at the list, uh, we have three different wines that we prepared is the Big Heads, the Big Head Wines 2020 Chenin Blanc, the Ravine Vineyards 2020 Sauvignon Blanc, and the Oxley Estate Winery 2020 Pinot Gris. So those are kind of the three wines. If you have those at home, if you want to taste them or think about those as uh, Ricky and Olivia are going through the recipes, that would be great. And then as you're kind of cooking it, or when we get near the end of that course, I'll just talk about the three wines a little bit more and the producers, if that works for you guys. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. You All right. Here? That sounds great. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much for the lovely intro. So uh, as Matt Gillian mentioned, we are uh, mainly based at Westcott Vineyards uh, for most of the year doing our pop-ups and running the pop-up restaurant there. Today, uh, Christine Flynn and uh, the Good Earth Winery uh, graciously let us use their demo kitchen because as you can see, it's uh, it's kind of perfect for doing something like this as opposed to maybe cooking out of our, uh, out of our house. So uh, you guys have a better view of, uh, of everything that we're doing. Uh, we also have two um, of our restaurant staff helping us out today. Uh, Brie, who is a front of house, uh, is working behind the camera for us. And then also Ian, one of our cooks, is sort of helping us uh, get the wines in shot. And I'm uh, going to keep an eye on the chat if you guys have any questions. But, uh, but yeah, so we're going to start cooking. So the whole idea about this menu is that it's, uh, it's very similar to what we'd serve uh, at the restaurant in Westcott. Um, very fun, very playful, kind of nostalgic, uh, plays on certain dishes. The Brie Saganaki comes from uh, my first restaurant job. Actually, I was, I was actually a, a food runner uh, at a Greek restaurant in Toronto uh, while I was still in culinary school, kind of, you know, make some bucks and things like that. But uh, yeah, this was one of my roles as a food runner, uh, believe it or not. We were the ones that went table side and lit the cheese on fire and said opa. And uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. So we wanted to kind of recreate that by using some, uh, some local ingredients and uh, doing it our way. So. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be served with uh, deep fried saltine crackers, which is sort of a staple on our menu uh, at Westcott or any of our pop ups. It's kind of our favorite vessel to put anything from cheese, tartare, uh, chicken liver mousse, which is you know what we're making later, but uh, pretty much anything. It's, it's a perfect vessel. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, Olivia working the uh, deep fried saltines and then we'll uh, get on to writing the, the cheese on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, as Ricky mentioned, uh, we incorporate deep fried saltines in. Most of our dishes, um, it's one of those things that if you're having them raw, uncooked, uh, they do tend to have a very chalky, uh, drying mouth kind of uh, sensation. Uh, but once you deep fry them, they're super buttery, briochey, crisp, and they really pair well um, with most wines uh, and really help um, balance out um, dishes. So what we're doing, uh, we have a pot here. If you have a countertop deep fryer, awesome, do that. Um, but we're setting our temperature to 350, 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, so we just have the um, oil on low. It's not simmering at all. We don't want it to be boiling or anything. Then we have our uh, saltine crackers. Um, and this is hot oil, so be careful at home if you are following along with us. We will be kind of using a little bit of magic of television for some uh, dishes today, uh, just because we have a lot to go over in an hour and a half. Yeah, we're doing four dishes in an hour and a half. So uh, <laughs> if you guys do have any questions about stuff, you can definitely uh, message us on our Instagram or on the yeah. And if you are cooking stuff. along, just um, you, you can try to keep up. Yeah, yeah. and go at your own pace. Have fun and just watch as well. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is add a couple of saltines in. It takes about like 30 seconds. Uh, there's about uh, two inches of oil in this pot here. I'm just going to add them in. And then with a slotted spoon or anything like a fine mash strainer, just going to scoop them out and pop them in a lined uh, bowl with some paper towel before I season them. I'm just going to pop them in and then they're just in there for 30 seconds. 
napkins, getting some color, nice golden brown. Depending on how hot your oil is, it could go even faster than that, um, as we're seeing right now. So then once they have a nice golden color like that, just strain them a bit. Yeah. Because these crackers are going to pick up fats and liquids very, very quickly. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen the uh, the saltine cracker challenge where people put it, I don't know if it was like a dozen or however many in their mouth, just to see how much moisture it sets up. So these actually pick up a lot of flavor, a lot of fats really, really quickly. Uh, if you're not comfortable with deep frying, I've also done this uh, on a roasting pan. Uh, you can use your leftover bacon fat from your breakfast. Uh, you can use schmaltz if you have that. Uh, you can use butter. Um, but for us, we just like to use oil. Just, just add sort of like a like a richness to it. So anyways, yeah, this is taking a lot quicker just because the oil got quite hot while I was chatting. But um, yeah, 10 to 15 seconds even. Once you see the color change, they're ready to go. And then and what we're doing is we're tossing them in a little bit of a seasoning blend here. So we have uh, some dill, some parsley, and some sesame seeds, as well as some salt and pepper. Um, depending on kind of what the dishes you're using them for, whether it be, uh, you know, tartare or the brie or um, a pate of sorts, uh, you can definitely create your own seasoning blend. Uh, we just have kind of a nice herbaceous and nutty seasoning blend, and then I'm just going to salt it. And then that's about it. Just let them cool before you snap on them, and they are very addictive, so watch out. <clears throat> So that's already the first half of our uh, our first dish. We wanted to go pretty quickly through all uh, all these dishes so that we can you know show you as much as we can. Uh, the next part is going to be the actual uh, saganaki. So uh, traditionally, and if you go to a Greek restaurant, they'll use um, pardon my uh, pronunciation, but it's like a kefalotiri or uh, or a humumi. I think a lot more people are, are familiar with the humumi. Uh, but we wanted to uh, use a Greek because I think that this pairs not just flavor-wise, but texturally really well with wines because it's a very creamy, creamy cheese. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be super interesting to, uh, to taste this with wines. And this is something that we've done on the patio. We've done um, a type uh, of this dish. We did a big brie on the patio and it went really, really well with uh, sparkling wine, our whites, and even, uh, even pinots. So, uh, so yeah, so what I have here in front of me is a preheated pan. Um, it's best to use a nonstick if possible. And then now that it's fairly hot, because I got this preheated as Olivia was starting the, uh, the saltine crackers, uh, I'm going to add a little bit of canola oil or vegetable oil, whichever one you use for, uh, for cooking, uh, into the pan just to coat the bottom. And then mix it around a little bit. Even the amount of oil, it's not super important because you're using a nonstick. This is more to add to the, the frying uh, of the actual cheese so that you can actually crisp up uh Ryan. So I'm just gonna add a bit more oil there. And then if you guys have the recipe in front of you, we mentioned that you should probably have your cheese very, very, very cold uh, or frozen, uh, which is best. Uh, this has been frozen for a little while now. So uh, the reason we do that is because depending on the age of your cheese, uh, it's gonna ooze out very, very quickly. So um rule of thumb is the older your breed or camembert is. Uh, the more funky and more woozy it's going to be. The younger, you don't need to worry about it too much. It's more of like a firm or semi-firm cheese. Uh, we are using Guns Hill um, Artisanal Brie. We've used these on the patio and we find because it's aged really well. Uh, they, they do lose uh, a little bit, so that's why you like to freeze these ones before we put it in. So now that we have our very cold, almost frozen, if not frozen brie, uh, our pan with hot oil, and the pan is also preheated, we're going to make sure that we put it in very carefully, because sometimes when you well when you freeze anything, you'll sometimes uh, develop ice crystals, and the ice crystals could uh, create flare up. And we don't want the cheese to set on fire just yet. We want to control that. So what we want to do is just make sure that enough oil is coated on the bottom, and it's a little it's it's essentially frying in the pan. And what we're going to do is we're going to treat just like in a Greek restaurant, we're going to use this pan. Um, as the serving dish uh, for the cheese, um, because more often than not, uh, sometimes the wines will break a little bit, your cheese will start to ooze out a little bit earlier than you want, which is totally fine because you're going to end up cutting into it uh, and enjoying it with uh, the crackers anyway. Uh, alternatively, you can plate this, but we kind of want to keep it as traditional as possible, light it in the pan, and then serve it uh, in you know, the pan. So, 
you take a look, we're starting to get a little bit of color there. This is kind of hot, but I'll also show on, on this camera. We're getting a little bit of color. Uh, we're gonna go take it a little bit further though. You can also use tongs for this at home instead of uh, with your <laughs> hand or a spatula. And what's great about this recipe is depending on what wine you're drinking, um, we've done like a very, a little bit more of a traditional like Greek flavor profile. We have some lemon, we have some fennel, we have some oregano. Um, but if you're maybe pairing it, you want to do a Greek flambe with peaches and then do Chardonnay or with plums and cherries and pair it with a Pinot. Um, both of those are great. So it's a very versatile dish and with simple ingredients and kind of a fun thing to do uh, when you have guests over as well. Mm -hmm. And already, you can already start to smell like fried cheese. Like, like think about when you're making a grilled cheese sandwich and some of the cheese comes out of the end uh, onto the pan, that sort of delicious smell. Well, that's what's happening right here, uh, which is lovely. And uh, it sort of does take me back to you know, our first restaurant job when there's a teenage Ricky serving at a Greek restaurant surrounded by you know, older Greek men. Uh, and I was, the one, I was the one doing the stagnati for the guests. So, uh, you can imagine the kind of looks I got as I showed up to the table. They're like, ah, I don't know if this is very traditional, but uh, <laughs> by the end of it, I think I learned more. But, um, but yeah, so I'm starting to smell it caramelizing, and that's kind of the color you want. I don't know if you can see how golden brown that is, but I'm going to flip that over, and you can see like it's it's super soft on, on top already, even having this been uh, frozen ahead of time. So it's not going to take very, very long. Um, so as the second side is cooking, we'll go over sort of a couple safety things. If you are going to sort of light it in front of guests, if you're trying to show off to your friends, I suggest maybe uh, doing it in a very well-ventilated space or maybe on, on your patio outside, maybe in your backyard. Um, but always make sure no one's downwind from that too. Because we did have a patio at that one restaurant to make sure that uh, guests and also ourselves were not downwind from that. So. <laughs> So that looks delicious. I, I want to just interject that the one thing I know for sure I'm making today is these saltine crackers because <laughs> they are addicting and I can't wait to make them. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this and I thought it was more complicated than that. So this is excellent. Oh, no, so indeed. great. And, uh, and the cheese too. I think I'm going to try that tonight. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly talk about mm -hmm. while that's cooking. A couple of the wines. Uh, so, you know, we tried to break up for this, uh, you know, first course, really kind of to showcase the flexibility of different grape varieties that you might not try normally. Um, and you guys have those nicely laid out at the front there. But we have uh, Big Head uh, Chenin Blanc, which uh, is a variety that is grown in um, northern France and Loire region, and also in South Africa quite a bit. Uh, we only have a really tiny little bit in Ontario, and the Big Head Winery probably is the most well-known, I think. Uh, they, they also have some at Rife Winery, uh, but again, it's, it's um, a more difficult variety to grow in Ontario, but if you haven't tasted it, um, Shannon definitely is one of my favorite varieties. It's got a lot of, um, it's known for its acidity and uh, just has a different uh, taste profile, uh, kind of a waxy character. So something, um, again, we thought would be interesting to try with this type of pairing. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys got a chance to taste that. Are you uh, Shannon lovers or have you tasted Shannon Blanc much? Oh, Either of you? That. Yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we were <laughs> Excellent. so excited to see this one on actually. And it's definitely one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we're very, very uh, big. All, all the wineries they, they, they sent over, but uh, Big Head's always a, always a fun one. But, um, but yeah, I think we're up to pretty much the last stage of the dish. I flipped it over one more time because we were getting really good caramelization on uh, that side of the cheese as well. So what I'm going to do is just make sure that the pan is pretty hot. Depending on how much oil you put in the pan, I suggest maybe taking a little bit out just so you don't have a massive flare up. Just a touch. I'm going to bring that back up as hot as I can and then sort of very carefully add in the booze. You can use whatever you want at the restaurant that uh, I first learned this in. We use like brandy 
uh, obviously, and I agree with that. Um, we're using uh, Joe and Dry. Uh, so they were uh, gracious enough to, to give us some of this. Adds a lot of um, really great, great caramelized flavors once you once you light it. Uh, but yeah, so we have a I think eight of the top, which translates to about an ounce, a full ounce. I mean, take it off the heat, which is very important because uh, once it does flare up, the alcohol is going to cook off. Uh, you don't need any uh, external flames or anything like that. Uh, and then sometimes we get a really big flame, sometimes we uh, won't, but we'll sort of see how this one goes. And then with a barbecue lighter, so it's nice and long. And then you have your ounce of booze. You're going to throw that in. And then make sure that you know how to use the lighter properly. Or maybe. Or sometimes you won't get a flame uh, at all. I promise uh, we, we worked on this just before. I think our writers are sort of keeping on it. What we can imagine is a big opa and then a huge flame. I think it's already cooked out, oh, which is fine. So essentially, what's going to happen is your alcohol is going to cook out in the pan naturally. Uh, the idea of lighting it is to make it a little bit more fun and that it's going to sort of accelerate the uh, the lighting of the flame there. Uh, you know what? Maybe we'll try another one a little bit later. But yeah, so that's essentially what happens. And then it will reduce and sort of create like a bit of a sauce in the pan there. Uh, and then there you go. So then what we're going to do is we're going to start plating it. So I don't know if all of you want to start garnishing it. You want to plate it uh, on this guy. We'll just do it all again. And then I'm sure, I think there's, I think also there's a couple more wines that Megan was talking about uh, that pair really well with this too. And the nice squeeze of lemon there. And we have some dill as well. Mm -hmm. There we go. Awesome. Couple little spots. There we are. And then we also have the deep fried saltines that we seasoned earlier. And then um, we'll just let that set. But basically, you can cut into it right away. It'll be nice and hot and it'll start oozing out. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then that's that one. Sorry about it being very anticlimactic. I swear it <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so then. Um, um, the other, I don't know, Megan, did you want to touch base on other of uh, any of the other wines? Um, yes, I would like to do that. That looks delicious and it is uh, really quick. So that's, uh, yeah, I'm excited oh, yeah. to have that. I'm probably going to have that for dinner, a whole wheel of that cheese myself. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it won't be healthy, but okay. So the next thing I wanted to show uh, tonight and hopefully people have, like I said, um, some people got some of the kits and purchased those, which was great through Vinnie Ventures, uh, which is a new partner that does these sample kits, is the Pinot Gris from Oxley Estate Winery in Lake Erie North Shore. So Pinot Gris is uh, certainly something that we grow quite a bit of in Ontario. And you might know it as Pinot Grigio. It's the same grape variety. It often just refers to stylistically how people make Pinot Gris. So in Italy, they call it Pinot Grigio. And in France, they call it Pinot Gris. So when wineries in Ontario name theirs, it usually is an indication of style. So Pinot Gris, the color of the grape actually, it does have some pinky hue to the grape skin. So depending on how you press it, and this is what happens with white wine is you normally wanna press and not get skin color unless you're looking for skin color when you're making uh, different varieties. Uh, so the Pinot Gris is a 2020 from Oxley and it, it does have kind of a little bit of a pinky coppery hue to it. And um, I think it's, uh, it's a lovely wine. And I think uh, the, the um, with Pinot Gris, what you often find is a little bit of a little bit of like grippy texture at the end, even though the wine is dry. And so I think, you know, that complexity and that texture will probably go very well with this dish, dish, the Saganaki. So that is the second wine that we were tasting in the middle there that you have. And then the third one is Sauvignon Blanc from Ravine Winery. And uh, this winery is in uh, Niagara on the Lake in St. David's Bench. And they have uh, a number of different varieties and but they've come become quite well known with their Sauvignon Blanc. 
Again, Sauvignon Blanc as a grape variety is very popular from different countries. In Ontario, we have more of a limited amount compared to let's say Chardonnay or Riesling that we produce, but a fair amount of wineries are producing Sauvignon Blanc, again, in different styles. I love this uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Again, it's a dry white wine. It definitely has the aromatics that are classic Sauvignon Blanc in the sense of um, kind of grassy notes and herbaceous notes. And uh, people that are Sauvignon Blanc lovers are just going to love this wine. And again, I think it's a wonderful type of wine to use uh, in an appetizer kind of format, uh, casual get togethers and so on. So you, you can certainly pair it with the main course, but I, I like it in kind of that, um, this recipe style. So cheers. Yeah, do you want to unmute us? Sorry. Yeah, okay. awesome. Sorry. <laughs> we were confused. Yeah, uh, so we're gonna start on our next dish, which is our take on uh peanut butter and jelly sandwich, uh, but in the form of chicken liver mousse. Uh, our peanut butter sort of flavor is gonna come from uh tahini, which we got from Parallel Brothers, the beef tahini uh, spe specifically. Uh, and then the jelly, uh, we're gonna show you guys how to make. Uh, your own wine jellies at home using some gelatin. Uh, today we're using West Coast Pinot Noir, but uh, you can pretty much use any red uh, or white wine that you want. Uh, so yeah, so first we're going to start with the uh, the chicken liver mousse or the pate. This is kind of a cross. Uh, it's more of a pate recipe, but we uh, uh, bumped up the uh, the amount of liquids to it, so it's a little bit smoother, a little bit more uh, spreadable. So if you can see here, uh, what we have is we have our uh, either chicken livers or if you, what we use is a uh, king quail ducks uh, duck liver uh, for a duck liver mousse. That just adds a little bit more minerality, a little bit of earthiness. Uh, again, that would pair really, really well with uh, West Coast Pinot Noir, but you can use chicken livers if you want as well. Um, and then we have the rest of the ingredients here, which is kind of go, all going to go into the pot as we, uh, we puree it. And then uh, we'll show you how to, to make them in a sous vide. So uh, at first we were a little worried about using sous vide for uh, like a VQA at home session, but then we realized that more and more people uh, have circulators at home, have sous vide, so that uh, if you see behind us, it's sort of uh, an immersion circulator. So this stick here is controlling the temperature of the water in here, keeping it at a one, uh, 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but another way you can do it is once we get to this stage where it's in the jar, you can put it in, uh, in a baking dish Fill with water and also food in your oven as well. So we'll walk you through that as well. Uh, but what we like about sous vide is that it's just so easy and you can kind of, kind of like a set it and forget it kind of thing. Um, our recipe takes about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, but again, if you're doing stuff around the house and you forget and it's in there for two hours, uh, it's not the biggest deal, right? Because it'll never, it'll never go over that 155 uh, degrees. Yeah, we wanted to do chicken liver mousse or a duck liver mousse. Uh, one, it, it's a great appetizer to have. Um, and also, I find that a lot of people maybe are intimidated by making something like this or using um, that part. Um, livers, you can find at the grocery store super easily. And um, they maybe are an intimidating thing to buy because who knows what to do with them. But this is such a simple recipe. It takes about 10 minutes. And it lasts in your fridge for like two weeks. So it's also one of those things too, where I think if you enjoy it, you really enjoy it, but you never get around to actually making it yourself. Uh, if you're a big fan of chicken or duck liver mousse, you can start you're having it at a restaurant and things like that. We're going to show you how sort of simple it is uh, to make it home. So what we have is a little uh, tiny food processor. Um, what you can do is it is a blender. Uh, we do have a large Vitamix. What we did was we scaled this recipe down so that if you're making it at home, you're not ending up with jars and jars of chicken, uh, duck liver mousse or chicken liver mousse. Uh, so it is better if you use something a little bit smaller. If you are going to use a large blender like what we have, uh, I would scale the recipe up a little bit. Um, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to start putting things into uh, the food processor and get it blended up. So what I have here is the, uh, the duck livers, which were already uh, sort of clean and uh, is ready to go. So I don't know if you guys can see on that one there, but it's uh, it's all ready. So what, what I did to clean it was I soaked it in cold water, uh, dried it really well, and then took off any sort of fat and sinews that are on there. So you can see, all you can really see is, uh, is duck liver, uh, which is like that dark red 
uh, sort of protein. And that's just done with like a simple small knife, mm -hmm. a paring knife, and you can just um, just cut out the pieces um, that Ricky was talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and then you're left with the liver. Yeah. So the only part where it it doesn't even really get complicated, but it's important the stages in which you uh, puree it. Anything. So what we're going to do is, uh, because as you puree mainly dairy, uh, you are going to change what happens to the dairy if you over whip it, uh, such as butter or cream. And so those things we know for sure are going to last. Uh, but the things that we're going to do first is our salts. Uh, so here we have our regular kosher salt that's going to go in. And then we also have optionally uh, pink salt. Uh, it's actually not very hard to find anymore. Uh, what this is used is in like a lot of uh, sausage making, charcuterie, brines for specifically like hams or red meat when you want to keep color. Uh, so if, if you ever wondered how hams, even if you cook it for hours and hours, it, it kept that color of pink, it's because of the pink salt, which is uh, it's essentially salt with nitrates added to it. Um, so I'm going to add that in to the mix as well. And then I'm going to add the ice wine. And one egg yolk. So this recipe is super, super easy to scale as well too. If you wanted to go a little bit higher um, and you wanted to end up with a little bit more, you're essentially going to get probably just under two mason jars worth of chicken liver mousse, uh, which is what kind of kind of what we thought uh, the home cook would want. Uh, but again, if you want you know Christmas gifts, holiday gifts, things like that, you can definitely scale it up. The numbers are all pretty much squared, uh, so it's easy to, to do that. So I'm going to bring this behind us and puree it. So while uh, Ricky's pureeing, uh, it does get a little bit noisy. Um, but so I don't know if you want to, but he's just a uh, few seconds there. But so what he's doing is puring that until it's super smooth, um, emulsifying the egg yolk as well as uh, the salt in there. Um, now he's done, and then we're gonna slowly add in the dairy as well. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So I pretty much made it's it's a complete liquid there. It's uh, there aren't any sort of clumps or chunks in it, uh, and that's why it's important to do this before you add the dairy. If we were to add the dairy in first, um, you start to worry. I mean, it, it's not a huge deal, but you start to worry about uh, possibly the the cream starting to to whip a little bit, and even the butter you're taking it past the stage that you want it to be at. Uh, as well. So at this point, I'm just going to add all the cream into it and then all of the melted butter. So it does seem like a lot of liquid in terms of the ratio to uh, the livers. But again, when you see our finished product, it's a lot more smooth uh, as opposed to a pate where you can sort of set it in a log and slice it. Okay. So then I'm just going to go back on just for a couple seconds. And um, uh, I'm sure Magdalena will talk more about the wine paired with this. Um, but um, us at Westcott, we love pairing, um, especially the Westcott Pinot. You know, it's beautiful to pair with a liver mousse that's really just like earthy and um, rich in minerality as well. So what you're going to end up with is a color very similar to, uh, I don't know how appetizing this is or not, but it's kind of like a, like a chocolate shake. I can bring this over to the main camera. Uh, very, very smooth. It's a lot paler than you think it'll uh, be. But what you'll notice is after it cooks, it'll get nice and beautifully pink uh, once it's cooked and chilled. So what we're going to do is just grab our mason jars. And then pour it straight in. You don't necessarily need to go all the way. I like to go just under um, where the lids start to tighten a little bit. I may have gone a little bit higher on the first one there. And then once it goes in, you're just gonna uh, burp the chicken liver mousse a little bit. So you're gonna find a towel and you're just going to lightly tap it. And what that's going to do is going to have some of the air bubbles sort of pop. And then there's not going to be so much pressure inside the jar 
as we put it in the uh, chicken liver, uh, in the sous vide. So our sous vide is set to 155 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So we're just gonna put the lids on that, pop it in the sous vide, and then check back in it uh, in an hour. So it's important when you put these lids on, uh, because it's gonna be in a high temperature sort of situation where air and pretty much anything will start to expand, uh, you wanna go is you know fairly tight, but then take it back maybe about a quarter inch or so. Um, like, like with mason jars, you don't need to worry about water going in because of the, uh, the lid that's on there, but you do wanna open it up a little bit so that some air can push out without water going in. So it's not gonna be you know super, super tight, but uh, just tighten it up. And then we're gonna place these into the circulators. Uh, so when we tested these ones out, for this size jar, it's actually gonna be closer to about 60 minutes. Uh, if you were gonna do one batch in one jar, so if you combine those into one of the more traditional, I think eight ounce uh, jars, that would probably take closer to about 90 minutes because you want the temperature to reach uh, into the middle. So this will be closer to about 60, 65 minutes. And then once they're ready, you take them out, Oh, yeah. Oh, that's okay. I was actually just going to ask you a quick question too before I get into the wines. But um, where do you get duck liver? I love duck oh. liver mousse, but normally I get chicken liver is easier to get. So where could people get that so we were, in Ontario? With, uh, with King Cole ducks. Uh, they're lovely, lovely people. Uh, obviously, we're at an advantage uh, being in the industry, so we can order it from them wholesale. But you are starting to see in grocery stores, you're seeing a lot more of King Cole's uh, products uh, on shelves. Okay. Uh, what we suggest doing is going to your local butcher and asking them. So for us down here, we usually go to uh, Gomez, which is in St. Catharines. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're in Toronto, definitely go to like Sandigan's Meat Locker. Uh, you know, they're pretty, they'll pretty much always have it. Uh, as long as you maybe ask ahead of time, they'll pull it out of the freezer or something like that. But, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, just check in with your local butcher, and then if you're lucky enough, some some uh, grocery stores will have it, because we are starting to see King Cold Dust pop up. Okay, uh, well, that, that's good to know, uh, because again, I you, you normally don't see them as much, but it's good to see that that's the case. So I just wanted to echo your comment uh, for sure on the Pinot Noir from Westcott. And yeah, uh, yeah so, you know, for in Ontario, uh, of course, we are fortunate because we have some kind of core varieties and that we make, including Pinot Noir and Gamay Noir, which we've suggested for this pairing. And really, you know, duck itself is, you know, Pinot Noir is kind of that classic pairing. Uh, and we certainly thought it would go with this uh, duck liver pate that you're making. So Westcott Winery is in, for those of you that don't know it, and I'm just gonna pop this, uh, hopefully you can see a little bit. Um, the uh, the label here, they are in Vine Mount Ridge uh, in Niagara Peninsula. Ontario has uh, three primary appellations, just to remind everybody, we have Lake Erie North Shore. We just had a wine from there in the first course. Also Prince Edward County, we're going to be having one coming up. And then Niagara Peninsula itself has 10 sub appellations. So really these sub appellations, which are um, smaller kind of delineated places in Ontario, Ontario and Vine Mount Ridge is on top of the escarpment. It's one of the coolest sub Appalachians and Westcott Winery has been making wonderful wines there for a number of years, focusing very much on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So I haven't tasted this yet, but I know what I, I took a little pre-taste before, but I know that what you're going to find is uh, it's going to be dry. Uh, you can see from the color, it's a little bit kind of a lighter um, you know, Ontario's Pinots are kind of known for being elegant, more lifted, floral, uh, yet with texture and body. So um, this is going to be lovely with, with the pairing. And uh, I know that I don't have to convince either of you of this because you are working at Westcott all the time and enjoying these wines regularly, I'm thinking. So that's great. Um, the other wine that we have I don't want to do too much slurping on uh, on camera here. The other wine that we have paired is Gamay Noir. So if you're a Pinot Noir lover, it's probably true that you also really like Gamay Noir, or maybe you didn't know you might like Gamay Noir. So this is another variety that we do really well in Ontario. And one of the pioneers uh, in Ontario in general is Shadow de Charmes Winery in Niagara on the Lake on the um, St. David's Bench. 
They have been making Gamay Noir since probably the late 1970s when they started their winery early 1980s. And Gamay has a lot of similarities to Pinot, just a little bit different. It has a lot of the same floral red fruit character, but I would say it's a little bit more um, often maybe described as not quite as serious as Pinot. Uh, it's a more accessible and maybe a little bit more lively. Um, uh, there's definitely earthy notes similar to Pinot Noir. I would suggest in order to understand the differences that you actually try Pinot Noir and Gamay Noir side by side by a couple of producers and it will really, really be obvious to you why they're kind of in the same family. They're two grape varieties, uh, red grape varieties of Burgundy, France, and they do very well here in Ontario. So this again is a, a lovely um, wine that will pair perfectly with this, with this duck liver pate. And then the other wine that we are suggesting is a classic pairing of uh, duck liver pate with a sweet wine. It's kind of like that foie gras Sautern pairing, Sautern being from uh, France in, near Bordeaux and, or in Bordeaux. And um, we in Ontario have ice wine. So that's kind of our flagship sweet wine. And uh, sweet wine can actually be paired with so many things. Dessert wine is of course uh, kind of the name that people call it because it's often used for dessert or with dessert. But the thing about ice wine is it's much more versatile than people think. And we're constantly trying to remind people of that to really kind of try ice wine throughout a meal and just have fun with it because you can really, first of all, this appetizer, uh, it's kind of a savory theme is very easy to, uh, to have with ice wine. So you can have that for a get together uh, or you know just a family dinner where you wanna start with something sweet. And what I would suggest is if you open a bottle of ice wine, you try it with almost every course. Uh, I have a friend of mine who's a sommelier in France and he, one of his favorite pairings that he suggested to me and is amazingly de delicious is a Sunday roast chicken uh, and having ice wine with the main course. So experiment with that. Uh, you will definitely not be disappointed in having ice wine with a chicken liver um, or duck liver in this case that we're doing duck liver pate. So this particular ice wine, again, is one of uh, the producers that has been making ice wine for some time and well-known is Lakeview Cellars. And uh, this is their Bedell ice wine. Ice wine is made with a couple of different varieties. Pr uh, white wine, it's uh, white ice wine is primarily made with Bedell, also sometimes made with Riesling. And then we also make some different red ice wines. So Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, which of course have very different uh, characteristics as well. So when you taste the Vidal ice wine, you'll certainly get uh, luscious uh, fruit character, kind of apricots, um, and of course the sweetness. But the other thing that's important with ice wine is you have very, very high acidity supporting and balancing that uh, sweetness. So. I'm just putting these kind of three wines out there. And uh, as you're getting ready to talk about finishing that dish, maybe you can tell me what your favorites are. I'm not sure if you've tasted all the wines or if you're gonna taste them there now with, with some of that pate that I'm assuming you made some earlier and that it's finished, I'm thinking, is that right? Yeah, we, uh, we have a magic step that just passes by. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but we are going to go over uh, just quickly. It's super easy, and uh, we always try and add something like fun and whimsical to our dishes, uh, bringing back a little bit of nostalgia, finding the kid and everyone kind of thing. So we're doing some red wine gummy bears um, to pair with uh, the Pinot Noir as well as the Gamay. Um, and it'll be the jelly for our peanut butter and jelly of the duck liver mousse. So basically, it's super simple. We have um, gelatin here in powder form and a quarter cup of red wine. It can be a red one of your choice. It can be, uh, we've done it with also sparkling wine tonight and added some gold in there for some fun. So lots of options uh, and versatility when making your gummy bears. Um, so we're just going to add this and let it dissolve into the red wine here and just give it a quick mix and that will like dissolve in about like 20 seconds and it's going to almost make like a little bit of a, a paste as it solidifies. 
And then over the stove, what we're gonna do is heat uh, the rest of that red wine. So right now we have the Westcott Pinot Noir. We're gonna make some Pinot Noir gummies. And we're gonna add um, a little bit of sugar just to enhance the sweetness. Um, and you want a little bit of sweet in the jelly for your gummy bear. So I'm just gonna light this. And what I'm doing is I'm just bringing this up to a boil, a uh, very light simmer just to dissolve the sugar. Uh, I'm not trying to reduce it or anything like that, or even boil off the alcohol taste because it is really fun to have a boozy gummy. Uh, and then as you can see already, uh, the gelatin has pretty much solidified and kind of created a paste with red wine that I did before. So it's almost like a paste. And so once this is boiling, I'm going to add the gelatin in to the pot, give it a quick stir to make sure everything's combined evenly. And then um, it depends what you have at home. We have these really fun silicone gummy bear molds and a little syringe. Um, and they just, um, you just pop the liquid in there. And I'll show you that in a second. And then that goes in the fridge for about uh, an hour to two hours until it's really nice and firm and they pop out. Um, if you're making the red wine jelly and you don't necessarily have a mold, you can do it in a little ramekin like this or in a bowl and set it in the fridge like you would jello. Um, and then once it's ready, you can cut it and scoop it out and put it on uh, top of the pate. So the reason why we add the gelatin to the liquid uh, separately, as opposed to putting it all together, it's to make sure that the gelatin doesn't clump. Uh, and if you just put it into the pot, it will just create clumps and it wouldn't uh, uh, distribute really well. So what you want to do is mix it into a little bit of cold liquid first, and then you mix it into the hot, and then you get a smooth uh, sort of jelly uh, to put into your mold. So now that this is boiling, I'm adding this in. And we really, um, for this, uh, it might seem like quite a lot of gelatin. We do double up on the amount of gelatin just so that you create a really nice firm gummy and it stays shaped at room temperature. Mm -hmm. Once that's all dissolved, um Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry. If I'm interrupting a step, I'm not sure if you want to finish that. I have a question about back to the pate, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Have, yeah. Okay. So you had mentioned that people can bake the duck liver pate yeah. in the oven if you don't have sous vide. So can you remind them how to do that uh, temperature and length of time, etc.? Yeah. So you essentially take like a probably a casserole dish. It really depends on the height of your jar. If you're using the uh, the small ones like that we have over here, you could pretty much use any casserole dish uh, that you wanted. If it's taller, I'll just find something that's deep enough that the, the dish will cover the amount of uh, mousse or pate that you have in the jars. And then what you do is uh, you place them into the casserole dish and then you pour hot water into that dish just until it's at or above the level of the actual pate in the jar. So okay. it's not terribly difficult, but again, you can see why we opted for the sous vide uh, method because you just sort of put it in here and plop it in. But with a little bit more care and a little bit, a uh, little bit more work, you can put it into a casserole dish, uh, and then you sort of just cover it, and then you can bake it in an oven, probably three fifty. And then uh, instead of uh, timing wise, you probably just have to check in on it, maybe after half an hour, forty five minutes. Uh, use an instant read thermometer and just make sure it's at temperature in the middle which is anywhere between 155 and 160. Okay. Yeah, that, so yeah, that's so interesting because... Like, uh... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I've made pate, not lately, but I have never made it that way in a bath, as you're describing. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have just put it in a pan and baked it, but I could see where this is yeah, very this much make it better. Yeah, <laughs> smoother. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, what you would do is... It's a very, like, silky consistency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, it's a, you get the same, the, the sort of the same product at the end. We just offer mm -hmm. the speed well, one because we have one and it's just a lot easier. You don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hold on. Uh, so, yeah, I well, think I that was the only other uh, question. The, uh, the gummy bears here. So I have the red wine with the gelatin dissolved inside. And then, oh, sorry. All I'm doing is filling each gummy bear um, if you are doing this without like a silicone mold, uh, I would suggest giving it a quick spray or brush with oil, uh, just to make sure that it's not going to be stuck, uh, at the, in the pan or the bowl you're using. 
Um, oops, and these syringes come with the gummy bear molds. We just ordered them on Amazon. To be honest. Um, but yeah, and we just fill them all the way up. And then once this is all filled up, you just pop it in the fridge. Uh, you can check on it and make sure it's set, just like Jello. Um, and then basically, yeah, when you're done, you have something that kind of looks like this. So these are our gummy bears here. We just pop them out and put them in a container. And we also created some champagne gummy bears or sparkling wine gummy bears with a little bit of edible gold in it to give it a little bit of a, a glimmer. Mm -hmm. So they taste like red wine and they're a little bit sweet. And perfect jelly for the top of the chicken liver mousse or duck liver mousse. Uh, Ricky's gonna put a couple, just to kind of show you how uh, the whole uh, mm -hmm. duck liver mousse comes together um, and how we create kind of the PB and J look. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see the uh, overshot, uh, overhead shot here, but uh, we essentially have our finished products here. And then um, this is what it looks like when it comes out of the sous vide or the water bath. So you can see that there's a small grayish kind of uh, layer on top. It's totally fine. It just means it was slightly oxidized during the cooking process. If you want to, you can scrape that off, uh, discard it, or what we do is we eat it. Um, and then you sort of have this beautiful pink uh, chicken liver mousse. So this was the exact same batch um, that we made uh, before. So it goes from like a chocolate shake sort of grayish brown to like a beautiful pink once the livers are cooked. And then it is quite smooth and spreadable. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a couple open-faced uh, pb &J sandwiches pretty much. So um, you can put as much as you want. And then scoop it straight on. I like to make a little bit of a well. Anyone who's eaten at uh, any of uh, our restaurants or working with us knows that I really like to do this with chicken and so I make like a little bit of a well. Um, it has a purpose. It's to hold the, uh, the tahini in place. Uh, Bree and Ian are having a laugh about that. Um, but yeah, so there, there's our chicken liver uh, mousse or pate. You can, uh, you can pretty much eat that how it is. Uh, but what we're going to do is add a little bit of earthy nuttiness. The fact that it's a beet tahini from um, Parallel Brothers adds a little bit of uh, like a sweetness to it. And again, it pairs really, really well with, uh, with Pinot or even the, the Gamay Noir. Um, but yeah, so we're just going to put a small well in there. So that's your sort of peanut butter uh, component of the PB&J. I mean, you also don't have to plate it this way. You could just have bread, crackers, and just have that on the tray as well. If you're having a party and things like that. Uh, but yeah, and then we're gonna finish it with some nice garnishes. Couple little gummy bears on each. And that'll help also with the pairing with whatever wine you're choosing. It's really fun to also enhance the wine pairing by uh, using the gummy bear as, like using the wine for your gummy bear as the one you're then we also have our sparkling wine gummy bears here with a little bit of gold. Um, we also have our edible gold leaf that we love to put on things just to fancy it up a bit. It's always fun. It feels like a special occasion. And then we also um, we have some suggested garnishes. Feel free to go with those, some sprouts or some of your favorite herbs on top. That'll pair nicely with the wine. Um, and we also have um, some dried cherries from Cherry Lane. Uh, sour cherries uh, in Niagara are definitely a thing in the summer. Um, and these are just preserved uh, dried sour cherries, which are delicious and chewy and sweet to go with the wines as well. Mm. Those look amazing. I wish I was with you right now. <laughs> I, I am not going to be able to make those myself, but I, I mean, I will, just not this moment. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to do some. Yes, but they look amazing. So, okay, that's wonderful. I think we covered all the questions that people um, were asking. Uh, there have been some comments that Arlene told me that people were comparing the um, Pinot Noir with the Gamay and kind of understanding the differences. So that's really good. Um, to kind of explore that. I also forgot to mention that if people are going on social media, could they use the hashtag VQA at home? So I apologize, I missed that part. So I think what we're going to do is move on to the next recipe. Is that right? The roasted squash guinatan, is that right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so this is okay. the, uh, this is actually one of like my favorite recipes. Um, Ricky used to make this at Coffee where we met, uh, the restaurant where we met, and uh, this is something that his mom makes for us uh, most times when we come over. It's uh, <laughs> definitely a most requested uh, dish, and I love it because it's so versatile, but it's also a really hearty vegetarian dish. Uh, if you're looking to uh, have something without meat in it uh, for the evening, um, as an Eastern European person, um, <laughs> uh, my background is Hungarian, so we're really heavy on the meat, um, but it is really nice hearty option uh, in terms of uh, something to serve uh, vegetarian wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we're going to start with making... Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. so one more second. Sorry about that. I don't know. If, um, I there's a couple more questions on the last dish before we get going. So people wondered how long will the gummy bears uh, keep? We gummy have had gummy bears in our fridge for a very, very long time because essentially you need to think about what's in it, and it's uh, it depends on how much of the alcohol you cook out of it. If uh, if you're, you're pretty much just heating it up uh, for the gelatin so that you can set it, it's pretty much just wine. Um, and it's wine with sugar as well. So something else to preserve it. So we've had, it, I'd say safely, I can comfortably say at least a week, but it's probably mm -hmm. much more than that. Uh, but because it's made with gelatin, it is temperature sensitive. So it's not something you want to leave out of the fridge very long. Uh, even if this was like a summer patio dish and uh, we put these out, uh, you know, on the deck for people to enjoy, probably within half an hour, 45 minutes, which they wouldn't last because they're delicious, but <laughs> people are gonna eat the, some food. Yeah. the gummy bears will start, they'll start to sweat a little bit, um, but they won't necessarily uh, melt completely. Uh, the recipe that we submitted for you guys, the gelatin is bumped up a little bit so that it does buy you a little bit more time, uh, but then you do have more chew. So again, everything we do today and anytime we do a cooking demo, we try to keep it as fluid as possible and as easy to change up as possible. So the gummy bears, if you don't want that much chew, use a little bit less gelatin. Uh, it may might take a little bit longer to set. It might be a little bit more delicate to come out, but it'll be more melt in your mouth. Uh, for, if you want them even harder, uh, you can add even more gelatin to it. Uh, and then with every other uh, dish that we do, sort of like, you don't necessarily need to do it step by step and with the exact measurements that we have, because what you'll see is with our next dish, uh, the guineton, um, different butternut squash or different squash varietals will have different starch levels too. So uh, to get a puree that's just like ours, you might need to add a little bit more water to yours or mm -hmm. maybe you need to cut back on the liquids a little bit, cut back on the coconut. Milk. So it's really just sort of going by eye, but, um, but yeah. Okay, that's there great. Any other questions? Uh, there are actually, well, one more thing. Can you ask, this is my question. Would it be okay to put the gummy bears in the freezer? Or is that a bad idea? So with gelatin, you need to, it can sometimes be a little uh, iffy, especially once ice crystals uh, are sort of uh, introduced to it. It might not hold its shape uh, quite as well, uh, especially if you want something that has a distinct look like a gummy bear. If you were doing cute, mm -hmm. you might not have to worry about it. Uh, but again, I think, I think the best bet is to just add a little bit more gelatin to it if you want, uh, which we in this recipe already has quite a bit. Uh, and then just they'll sort of last in the fridge. And as you can see, like from the beginning of starting the gelatin to the end of it, it's actually very, very quick. And based on the size of the gummy bears that we were doing, th those will probably set in about 45 minutes to an hour, maybe even okay. less than on your fridge. So for something that's that quick to do, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't worry so much about freezing in, keeping it for ahead of time, just do a batch as you need it, you know? Okay. So I, I have a question about wine and then I'll get to that. My, they did have a question about what was the brand of the beet tahini that you used? That is Parallel Brothers. So they are uh, Toronto based. They actually call it a uh, sesame butter as opposed to a tahini. Uh, they make beautiful, beautiful products. Uh, we were happy enough to, we were lucky enough to have them uh, visit our restaurant uh, over at Westcott. And then uh, we started using their product in pretty much any any anytime we needed a tahini or sesame butter, uh, but the one that okay. we use typically is their flavored beet tahini. Sesame okay. Butter. Okay, great. So we actually had a wine question. It seems like somebody's from New Jersey, which is interesting. That's very cool. I actually lived in New Jersey for seven years, so I'm not sure why that is. But if someone's from New Jersey and watching, that's great. Uh, great news. 
I used to live in Hohokus, New Jersey, which is not Hoboken. Uh, they're asking the question if we can ship wines for free to New Jersey. Unfortunately, we can't. <laughs> um, wineries, uh, of course, they're shipping wine across international borders of any country, whether it's in or coming into Canada from other countries or going out of Canada into the US, uh, there are a lot of regulations. So no, uh, we can't ship directly from here. Uh, we can invite you to hopefully visit the, sometime soon and maybe purchase some wines when you cross the border into the US. If you're from New Jersey, you can drive easily. It's a six and a half, seven hour drive and uh, you can actually bring wines across the border. Also, there are some wineries that are selling wine in the US. Uh, there are a couple of producers, Cave Spring Vineyard, I know, has uh, listings in New Jersey, actually, the town that I lived in, there were some wines in the shop there, and uh, in the New York area. So they're on our website, if you go to winecountryontario.ca, there is a section in the media area where there is where else are our wines sold, and you can kind of, you can see a list of regions outside of Ontario and what wineries export to different provinces and states and countries. And then you can contact the winery directly. So certainly if you have any further questions about wine, please get in touch with us. Uh, our contact information is on our website as well. So I will leave it at that. And I know that we still have two more recipes to get to. So I will go back and talk about the roasted squash. So hopefully that answered everybody's question about the wine. Yeah, so um, basically Gunnatan, uh, a very loose translation is cooked in coconut milk. Uh, and it is a squash based dish, um, sometimes cooked with shrimp, other vegetables as well. But we're gonna really focus on some local squash. Um, we have a couple of options as Ricky mentioned, depending on the size of your squash, the starch uh, content, it may take a little bit more time uh, to cook it in your oven. Um, but basically, if you're following along with the recipe, uh, we do have them posted as well, so you can always go back later. Um, but we peeled the butternut squash, and then we sliced it in half lengthwise and scooped out the inside. And then basically what we want to do is separate the neck of the squash from the bulb, and then cut them in half lengthwise again, which is what we have here. So they're cut, and they're almost like um, batons or rectangles, but they're quite large. And what we're going to do is... Uh, just toss them in a bit of uh, canola or vegetable oil, as well as some salt and pepper. And then we are roasting these for about 30 to 40 minutes at uh, 350 in the oven until they're really nice and caramelized. Um, and then this is going to be the base of the dish. Um, another uh, option we do have, so this is the butternut squash here. Um, and we just wanted to talk really quickly about some really cool squashes. Um, so um, our friends over at Promar Set, uh, Shane, he uh, manages and kind of operates the entire farm there. Um, and uh, this one, he wanted me to tell you, it's a very romantic name. It's called 1068. <laughs> um, so this is a hybrid squash and they're actually uh, producing these uh, as a single serve squash. So if you're cooking solo and you don't want to cut up a whole butternut squash, there's some really interesting uh, squashes to discover out there. Uh, this is a, a same family as the koji nut, um, but it's like the baby, the grandbaby of a koji nut. And it's um, really, it's uh, grown for its texture and sweetness. Uh, so it's going to be super smooth, uh, really uh, dense nutrition flavor as well. So that was kind of cool. I just wanted to touch base on that really quickly. So we do have some, when we're plating, we'll show you the finished product, but we did do a little bit of uh, the butternut squash that you saw, but then also the ones that we got from the garden at Palmer set uh, through Shane. So yeah. you guys will be able to see both. So these are gonna go into the oven at 350 for 40 minutes. And uh, when you're ready to serve your dish, you just pop them out of the oven um, and uh, you can either have it as a side, it's great as a vegetarian meat as well. And then what we're going to be doing is making the sauce. So um, basically, get a ton cooked in coconut milk. Um, Ricky actually taught me this recipe at Hawthorne. Uh, we're going to take the bulbs of the squash. We try and use everything as much as possible. So when you're scooping out the seeds, um, we also 
taken those and just uh, cleaned them and roasted them off like you would a pumpkin. You want to save those up. They're really tasty as a garnish. Um, and so what we're going to do is cut these in one and a half inch um, pieces. You don't have to be uh, very specific about how you cut them uh, because it's going to get pureed later. So it really doesn't matter um, how beautiful your pieces look. And then we also have onion that's chopped, our garlic, and our ginger that are going to go into the sauce as well. So yeah, so if you take a look even at the, uh, I guess if you will, the anatomy of the squash, uh, we did it this way uh, because you pretty much cut it off when it stops being uniform. And that's the part that will essentially become your squash steak, which is kind of why we left them really large batons. That, that, that way it can be sort of uh, like a vegetarian main. And then I know sometimes when people are dealing with like knobbly sort of vegetables, whether it's uh, an acorn squash, the, the bulb of a butternut squash, maybe a celery root, uh, you don't really know how to make it uh, uniform and you're worried about it not uh, cooking well. And that's why we divided it into the two halves. So that this way, we're not necessarily too worried about how we cut it, uh, as long as they're small enough that they'll cook relatively the same uh, length. Uh, but yeah, so that's an easy way. So if you're dealing with butternut squash, you know, this is the side where you'll get really beautiful cubes or dices. Uh, and then this is sort of for purees, uh, soups, and uh, things like that. Uh, so while I'm cutting this up and getting this ready, we just want to start the pan. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically what we're going to do is uh, get a pot uh, that will fit all the base of the butternut squash um, over medium heat uh, with a little bit of oil in it once it gets to medium heat. And we're going to sweat the garlic, ginger, and onions just until you get that like really beautiful aroma that things are cooking along uh, and that onions are a bit translucent. Um, so yeah, we're just getting the pot hot now. And then, once that's yeah, and then we're going to fast forward through the pureeing stage because uh, that little tiny guy I used for the, uh, the duck liver mousse was, was, that was, was pretty quiet. quiet. Uh, yeah. This one's like, a, like an airplane, yeah. uh, especially in this one. <laughs> so we're going to cut that part and go directly to showing you the puree. Uh, but again, like based on different squash, water levels, starch levels, things like that, You'll probably need to change, add a bit of water, maybe don't put quite as much coconut milk in at first uh, when you're pureeing it. Um, but the important step is showing you guys that you know we're sweating everything together. We're gonna cook the squash down until it's fork tender or soft. Essentially, if you're making like a mashed potato or something like that. Yeah. And then so it goes right into your blender and uh, puree. We like it a little bit uh, sturdy because uh, we like to do sort of some swipes and sort of pools. Maybe that little well that I showed you, the chicken mother moose on the plate as well. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, so we have the pot over medium heat, a little bit of oil inside. We've got the ginger, garlic, and onions sauteing. Um, and those are just gonna, until you get like a really nice aroma and a little bit of the onion translucent, you're gonna cook that. And while that's cooking, we have our butternut squash here as well as the apple cider vinegar, uh, which is a really nice component. It adds a beautiful acidity to the dish. Um, and what it's gonna do is deglaze uh, anything that's stuck on the bottom of the pot. So I'm gonna add the butternut squash and then deglaze with our apple cider vinegar. So that's getting all nice and sauteed there. Yeah, and then as we mentioned before, uh, we puree it. And then I think as Olivia is sort of going through that step, I'm going to slowly get a sort of finished product plate uh, together for you guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then uh, glaze with the apple cider vinegar. And then what we're going to do is add the coconut milk here. Uh, and this is what is going to cook the squash and kind of get all those flavors uh, combined and emulsified together. And then you're just going to cook this over um, medium uh, heat and let it simmer low um, until the squash is cooked, which probably will take about 10 to 15 minutes. 
Uh, but you want the squash to be really tender because you're pureeing it uh, into a really beautiful, smooth puree. And so this just simmers for a little bit until it is tender and cooked. And then, as we said before, we're not going to use this blender because it, it's just going to be a little too much for the volume. But um, what we do is we'll remove it from the heat, let it cool a bit, and then pop it in the blender, puree it until smooth, uh, season it with some salt and pepper, and then we return it to the pot just to reheat, because you can do this the day before and just have a container of this in your fridge. Um, but it's really beautiful squash puree, and that's going to be the sauce that we use on top of our roasted squash for the dinner time. And when you guys taste it, you're going to notice it's, it's very similar to like a coconut pumpkin or coconut squash soup. Uh, it's just a little bit thicker, uh, maybe a little bit heavier on the ginger because it's more of a sauce, so it is going to be a little bit more concentrated, but uh, this isn't necessarily a flavor that you haven't tasted before. I, I, I can't name a squash soup that didn't have ginger in it that I've ever had, and, and bay leaf and garlic and onions and things like that. The coconut milk, even then, is, is pretty common, but uh, it's just the ratios of it to make sure that it's concentrated enough that it's more of a sauce or a puree. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start getting a uh, plate together. And then Ollie's going to walk you through this sort of herb salad, which is very, very versatile. And again, can be anything uh, and everything that you want it to be in terms of what uh, you like in terms of flavors. So for the herb salad, that's going to be the top garnish for uh, this dish. We, um, we picked a variety of herbs. Uh, we have some mint, some fresh dill, cilantro, parsley, sunflower sprouts, and fresh arugula. Uh, so there's lots of flavors going on there. There's some fresh mintiness, there's pepperiness, there's a little bit of sweetness in the sunflower seeds. Um, honestly, anything that you have uh, in your fridge in terms of herbs is great. If you don't like cilantro, don't put it in. Um, but yeah, we have this. And then uh, we garnish it with a little bit of a cold pressed oil and vinegar. Season it with some salt and pepper. And this is what's just going to be on top of the uh, roasted squash to give it some really nice, fresh, herbaceous brightness. Um, and then we're also going to top it off with a little bit of hot honey. The one that we have here is called Buzz Hot Honey, and it's actually a product that uh, Christine from the Gutter, uh, she makes. It's a really awesome product. It's really nice and citrusy, has a little bit of heat to it, um, just to add to the dish, uh, the sweetness and the creaminess of the squash as well. So we'll just drizzle a little bit of that on top of the salad, toss it one more time, and then it'll be like the perfect garnish for this really lovely roasted squash. And it'll pair really awesome with some of the wines, um, especially that Gucci, uh, Everybody, I, really, know, I, that one. That I, I think everyone loves the name <laughs> from the Gucci. Yeah. The yeah. So uh, before I talk about the wine, so uh, and it's funny because it's reminding me there is a question about the coconut milk or you called it coconut cream, I think, on the recipe, yes. and then I was thinking about coconut cream pie or something like that. So I know that there's coconut. Like I get coconut milk in the cans. Is that what you meant? Or is there something more rich that you get that's oh, a yeah, coconut? Absolutely. And you don't okay. have to, I mean, traditionally it is with coconut milk uh, that's in the can. Uh, we've also done it with almond milk. You could do it with yeah. milk as well. But in terms of the difference between coconut cream and coconut milk, again, it just goes down to texture, uh, right. how rich uh, you sort of want it. Traditionally in the Philippines, it's mainly with coconut milk because it's more of a stew. So the way that we're creating it is, is more of a restaurant style. It's kind of like a, a squash steak with a sauce on top. Otherwise, it pretty much would have been everything into the pot. You said, sort of cook it down. It's it's more it's more similar to like a curry than it is what we're uh, plating here. But um, yeah, you can use coconut milk or coconut cream again. That's just going to adjust the, the richness to it. Uh, okay. But even between the two, I think the, the fat percentage is only like 10, 20 percent uh, different. So it's, it's not going to make it super thick or super thin. It's mainly just on, uh, on sort of palate and how you Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll talk about the wines and, and actually I do myself have butternut squash here. My, from a farm down the road, there's a great uh, person that has a tons of squash. When I drive by, I just pick up, um, pick up things all the time. And 
recently I've been making a lot of things with butternut squash. And so um, talking about the wines, uh, we wanted to kind of, we thought this, this dish, you know, really has a really a great opportunity to try different things uh, because as you pointed out, depending on what you make, you can kind of make um, different soups that are made with kind of different flavors, uh, Indian flavors, uh, you have coconut here, you, you know, you can kind of play around with, uh, with roasted squash. Uh, there's a squash pasta recipe that I, like a pasta sauce that I had made recently. So I've actually been exploring a lot with different wines to kind of taste. And so the three that we suggested uh, are fun for lots of different reasons. One of them, I actually, I've just tasted through them and, and I know that we have these in a different order on the list uh, in a suggestion. But if you have all three, I might suggest you start with the Organized Crime 2020 Sacrilege. And uh, so this is the bottle here. And uh, this producer has been making wine for some time. And Greg uh, Yemen is the winemaker and he's doing fabulous things. And I know that he's been playing around with making orange wine or skin fermented white wine. So for those of you that are not familiar with this wine style, it's actually, uh, it can be called orange wine, amber wine, skin fermented wine. It's not a new technique. It's actually a, a very historical method of making wine, uh, traditionally in Georgia, the country Georgia, and also uh, in parts of Italy uh, on the border of Slovenia and Croatia. And so what happens is with orange wine is you are actually taking white grapes and you're fermenting on the skins to extract tannin and color, where normally when you make white wine, you use white grapes and you press immediately to min minimize the contact with the skin so that you have like bright pale wines and not trying to extract the color and preserve the kind of primary fruit characters. So I personally have become very passionate about orange wines uh, recently over the last several years. And what's exciting is that in on, while there are many countries or there are a number of countries that have traditionally made this, uh, Canada, or not Canada, sorry, Ontario, Canada, uh, our appellation system is the second in the world to actually put a system in place to regulate the uh, method of making this. So South Africa had uh, a regulation system and we very recently have in about the last four years created an orange wine category. So with that, the wine, the grapes have to be fermented on the skins for a minimum of 10 days. So that way, you know that the winemaker is purposely making the wine of this style. The other thing that some people get confused at is that when you say orange wine, people might think it's made from oranges. It has nothing to do with oranges. It just, the color of the wine ends up being kind of an amber color. So this one is, um, it's actually made with three grape varieties for Bergstraminer, Riesling, and uh, Pinot Gris, which are all aromatic or semi-aromatic varieties that uh, are well suited to making orange wine. And what you'll find with orange wine is that you will still have certain characteristics of the primary fruit, but they'll be more subtle and they'll, there will be other characteristics that take on kind of more of an earthy nature. Some people describe the aromatics as tea-like. So it's a whole world of wine that's kind of undiscovered for people. It's certainly become more popular in the last, like I would say last five to eight years. And uh, it's kind of like the missing category that people maybe have been talking about. You have white wine, you have rosé, you have red wine, and now you have orange wine in there as well. Of course, other styles, sparkling and ice wine, and those things are separate. So I really do suggest that you try this. And I personally tried an orange wine recently with a butternut squash soup that was outstanding about a week ago. So I, I highly recommend it. The other thing, the second wine that you were just referring to uh, called Gucci, which of course is a fun name. And uh, it's kind of a trendy name that people are calling Gewürztraminer now, which is, which is fun because Gewürztraminer is a difficult word. Um, it's a Germanic word. I grew up with an Austrian father, so I, I think I pronounce it pretty well and I'm comfortable with it. But I think Gucci's fun. And uh, that is Rosewood Estates. And they have made this 100% uh, Gewürztraminer barrel fermented uh, and aged for 18 months on leaves. This is also very delicious, has a lot of texture and richness to it. So 
I know will go very well with this, um, with this recipe as well. Um, take Gewürztraminer itself has a lot of kind of uh, heady floral notes and spice character and, and certainly will pair very well with this, with this uh, food recipe that you're making. And then lastly, the Riesling from Redstone Winery. Uh, Riesling is one of the two most popular planted uh, grape varieties in Ontario and a, a variety that we grow very well. The thing about Riesling is, is that we make it in a number of styles in the sense that it can be very dry with uh, a little bit of sweetness or off dry. This one has about 36 grams of residual sugar. So it definitely has some sweetness. But again, with Riesling and in Ontario, we have a lot of natural acidity. So the, the sweetness is in harmony and is balanced. So this will go very well again with this dish because you have kind of the earthy character. And a lot of times when you have spicy notes like this, Riesling pairs perfectly and a little bit of sweetness actually really works well and harmonizes the dish. So these three wines, I think, are probably going to be one of my favorite pairings so far in some ways. So, and that looks beautiful. Look at that. Okay. Again, I wish there was delivery or you guys were next door to me in there. <laughs> You're building. Yes. <laughs> so I could just put it through the window and pass it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Kitchen magic. So um, I'm just going to check yeah. my uh, phone for questions. Hold on a second. So there is one question is uh, if someone wanted to substitute coconut milk, what would they do? Or what could they do? You can use traditional dairy. You can use milk. You can use uh, maybe milk cup with a little bit of cream. Uh, if you don't want dairy, uh, like Olivia said, you can maybe do goat milk. Uh, I know that's, a, that's pretty popular these days. Olivia likes to drink it with her, uh, with her coffees. Uh, you can do almond milk. Um, mm -hmm. with anything, yeah. If you wanted to, you can do it with just water. And, and then it's essentially just like a squash puree with ginger and an aromatics. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, like the vegetable stock yeah. would be great. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. That yeah. sounds good. So, as you can see, we plated it up for you guys. Uh, we have our herb salad on top uh, with some of our toasted pumpkin seeds and squash seeds. And then the squash puree on the bottom, which is the ginnachan. Uh, sauce and then the roasted squash a couple ways mm -hmm. uh, just to give you some variety and kind of I can feel my parents blowing their eyes right now based on how we played it because <laughs> it's, it's definitely again, not traditional yeah <laughs> it is usually a stew but uh, we kind of wanted to make it more of like a sort of a main or even a side dish kind of side dish but yeah sorry sorry mom but... <laughs> okay um so if you're cool then we're gonna move on to our last dish which is our main course, but surprisingly, it's, it's probably one of our fastest ones. Uh, it is our take on the ever beloved or ever hated filet -O fish sandwich from McDonald's. So we kind of took components that we like from that, uh, you know, being, being a chef, uh, being chef, or even, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're in the hospitality industry, you know, after work snacks usually are happening at 11, 12, 1, two, three in the morning. So the things that are open are fast food spots. So um, this is body by McDonald's right here. So <laughs> we're doing sort of a, I want to say maybe slightly healthier take, but more of a composed put together version of the filet fish uh, sandwich. Um, we're going to do it with some beautiful rainbow trout. It's going to be a pan seared dish as opposed to like a deep fried uh, sort of, I guess you could call it a patty, fish patty. Um, and we're serving it with uh, some grilled uh, romaine, and that's going to get topped with a gribiche sauce, which we'll walk you through. Uh, and that is sort of uh, inspired by by what we think is to be one of like the perfect bites. Even if you're thinking about something uh, as silly as having fast food, whether it's McDonald's or whatever it is that you're having, or even if you're having a souvlaki, a shawarma, uh, some sort of wrap. Um, what we find is the perfect bite is when you're done with the sandwich, sometimes in your wrapper, there's a, a little wad of <laughs> wilted warm lettuce that has soaked up all the flavors of the, of the sandwich or the wrap. Uh, it's covered in mayonnaise. Uh, it's super salty, but that was sort of the inspiration behind sort of grilling, wilting some romaine lettuce and covering it with a sauce for beige, just to sort of replicate that sort of 
uh, treat at the end of a, yeah. a sandwich. Yeah, it's so. like <laughs> a perfect last bite kind of thing. Yeah. And all of the flavors of this are an ode to the sandwich, uh, but a little bit more fancied up and created as a main, so you don't feel like you're just having a filet of fish for dinner. <laughs> uh, so Ricky's going to start off. Yeah. So again, what we're doing is we're starting with a uh, preheated pan. So whenever you're searing uh, steaks, fish, any sort of protein, or even vegetables, uh, it's very, very important to preheat your pan because what you need to think about doing without getting too technical or sciencey, uh, pans are usually made of metal. And when you preheat it, it changes the density of it. Uh, and it sort of expands a little bit, which actually, uh, surprisingly enough, makes it a little bit more nonstick. So I'm using a nonstick pan, but I've also done this with stainless steel. Uh, but the key is to sort of preheat your pan ahead of time, no matter what it is that you're cooking, preheat your pan, no oil. And then once it's hot, um, then you add your oil. And then you preheat your oil as well too. So once it starts to move around kind of like water, which will be very, very quickly, because again, you preheated your pan, uh, then you shouldn't have to worry too much uh, about your fish uh, sticking to the pan. But based on how my saganaki worked uh, earlier, maybe I'll have some fish sticking to the pan, but I'm hoping not. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a fish spatula. You can use a flat spatula, pretty much anything you want. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these beautiful uh, rainbow trout, which uh, we portion. You can get them portioned on your fishmonger uh, already. We've done this dish with a full half uh, fillet trout and that sort of goes straight into the pan like this. We broke it down so it's a little bit easier to share and a little bit easier to, uh, to eat. So my pan's hot. I'm going to season the skin side with some kosher salt. And then I'm going to put them into the pan. Move it around a little bit. You don't have to do it with your hand if you're not comfortable with it. You can use your spatula. But I move it around a little bit and press it to make sure the skin is making contact with the pan. Because sometimes what happens is when you cook fish, it'll start to like balloon and then you'll get crispy on the sides of it, but not the whole um, surface of the fish. So for the beginning of the cooking process, you want to press it down, depending on how comfortable uh, with it you are. But again, you can use your spatula for that. And then sort of press it down, move it. Not sticking, so something's working for us right now. Great. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think we do four pieces. And then, as that's cooking, I'll sort of guys, keep you guys posted on uh, when I know it's getting close to being finished. And Olivia's going to start working the sauce for the sauce, which is going to go on top of the romaine. So, as Ricky said, like, he's keeping the skin side down in the pan, nice and hot. Um, and it's gonna cook like this the entire time and maybe flip over um, just to finish the cooking, but that we cook it skin side down the entire time so that you're giving it a really nice crispy skin. So just so you know, the pan is preheated, but then I did bring it down to like medium low and sort of give it time to, to sort of make contact with the skin, get it crisp without burning it, and then also bring the heat up to the flesh so that it's, uh, so that it's cooked. All right, so. For the uh, sauce crebiche, um, crebiche is kind of a, a term uh, used with um, hard-boiled egg, herbs, pickles. Um, usually there's some kind of mayonnaise incorporated. You can do store-bought mayonnaise. Uh, we have like a house-made aioli here. Uh, we just skipped that step today uh, just because it does take a long time uh, to get mayonnaise right. Um, but this aioli um, egg-based mayo, uh, and then what we have is our uh, finely diced dill pickle. We have some diced uh, chopped boiled egg, a little bit of Dijon mustard, and some fresh herbs. So we did parsley and dill. And we're just gonna mix that all into our uh, aioli here. And this is gonna be the dressing for uh, the coating for the seared romaine. So a lot of these things are sort of familiar sort of flavors and ingredients that you know already. It's essentially a tartar sauce, and the only thing that differentiates it from a tartar sauce is we add um, is the addition of a uh, hard-boiled egg, chopped up. Um, so that creates sort of a verbiche sauce. Uh, and what that egg does is, one, it adds a little bit of body to it, for sure, um, but then also 
the I guess the gaseous sort of flavor that comes with with egg for the minerality. Um, yeah, without you know using um, unappetizing sort of terms, sort of adds to it and actually makes it really really lovely to pair with wines. Uh, as you know, uh, minerality is huge when it comes to preparing wines. Uh, so that's why we thought sauce for each as opposed to just a traditional tartar sauce uh, works really well for this. How about that for a segue, uh, Magdalena? <laughs> that's a perfect segue. Wow. <laughs> before okay. I can season this side of the fish, before Magdalena uh, starts talking about the wine. Okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. And so uh, for this, what we thought we would do is we would actually kind of focus on the world of Chardonnay. And uh, it's uh, the most planted grape uh, white vinifera that we have in Ontario, very close to Riesling, neck and neck. Um, it is a, a great variety for us in Ontario. I think almost every winery in Ontario of the 185 wineries probably makes a Chardonnay. And uh, the exciting thing is, is that it's, it does come, you know, it, Ontario has its own unique style, of course, or specific characteristics. If you compare them to elsewhere in the world, we're kind of caught between new world and old world. But within Chardonnay, you can certainly choose different styles. So again, for people that are maybe anti-Chardonnay or, or haven't maybe rediscovered Chardonnay, you really should try and explore. And uh, we actually in Ontario are hosted, have hosted for, I think, almost 12 years now. I think it's because of COVID, we haven't had uh, in-person ones, but the International Cool Climate Chardonnay celebration every July. And uh, we have about 60 wineries, 30 from Ontario and 30 international wineries. And, and what we do with this is really kind of over three days, explore how wonderful this grape is and how you can, within one grape variety, really have so many different styles. So here what we have is three different producers and actually from different pockets of Ontario. So Huff Estates Winery is the one that we've uh, selected from, so I wanna make sure the ones I have here, no, it's this one, of course, backwards on the thing. So Huff Estates Winery has been one, it's one of the first wineries in the Prince Edward County uh, sub uh, Appalachian, primary Appalachian, my apologies. And so, They've been making Chardonnay for some time. This is from a particular area in Prince Edward County uh, called South Bay. This is Catherine's South Bay Vineyard Chardonnay 2019. And what you will find with, with all of these Chardonnays, actually looking at the notes from the producers is most people will use uh, oak for, um, for their Chardonnay, but use different percentages of new oak. I would say now most people probably use anywhere between 10 to 25 or 30 percent new oak um, and what that does is it provides texture and character to chardonnay but also again stylistically and it depends on the region and what the winemaker is looking for the house style for instance so half estates um, was 15 months in french oak so i, I certainly recommend trying that and just from uh, the perspective of Prince Edward County, it's one of the coolest areas of Ontario. So you'll find that the Chardonnays there are usually generally a little bit leaner, um, more, I would say, kind of uh, vivid acidity. And so if you were putting that beside a Niagara or a Lake Erie North Shore Chardonnay, for instance. The other two Chardonnays are actually from Niagara Peninsula, but from two different sub appellations. So we have the Adamo Winery, which is is actually just north of Toronto, the actual winery, and they do have vineyards on site there. But what they also do, which is very exciting, is that Shauna White, the winemaker, she looks across Ontario to find different plots of land, uh, vineyards that she wants to explore. And so this particular Chardonnay, it's from the Foxcroft Vineyard in 20 Mile Bench. So again, when you taste Chardonnay from different wineries, you get the, the house style, but what you also get is different vineyards and in each area that you would taste Chardonnay from or any grape variety from Ontario, you'll really begun, begin to understand the sub appellations and what they provide and what they offer from the growing conditions and making the different um, characteristics of the grapes, for instance. And so the 2017 Oak Chardonnay Foxcroft Vineyard, uh, an excellent wine to try, again, also fermented uh, and aged in oak, 20% new oak. 
And then uh, the Chardonnay Mousquet, I thought was another interesting fun uh, Chardonnay for people to try is Hans Berger Winery. Uh, you know, it's been around for a couple of years, but it's newer, I guess, uh, when in the context of versus pioneers. It is actually in Creek Shores, which is just outside of Jordan. And uh, Kelly Mason is the winemaker there. She produces wine at a couple of different other projects as well, including her own project. And what I thought was interesting about this is that this is Chardonnay, but it's actually Chardonnay Mousquet. And Chardonnay Mousquet is actually a clone. Uh, it's a mutation of Chardonnay and um, it is in the Chardonnay family. What it does is it has a different characteristic. So there are a number of producers in Ontario that actually have isolated that and produced Chardonnay Mousquet. Some of them have um, different vines that are mixed into their vineyards. So you might have a Chardonnay from someone's vineyard where you might have a little bit of the floral characteristic that might be 2% of Chardonnay Mousquet in their vineyard. But in this case, you have this producer and vineyard where they've actually isolated this the Chardonnay Mousquet vines and they produce it as a variety, uh, single variety of bees. So again, this will have a different characteristic, often a much more floral note, um, Mousquet kind of like um, a little bit more leaning on kind of like uh, Muscat kind of, but still Chardonnay, not as floral, but more lifted than let's say a regular Chardonnay. So again, these are all great to taste. You're going to find different characteristics. And again, I challenge people to explore the Chardonnay world if you aren't convinced yet. And that's why I think with this dish, for instance, you can explore um, whatever style you like with this particular dish. So getting back to you guys, let's see how that dish is going. And um, we can just, I'm going to check my phone as well to see if there's any questions, but. Uh, okay. Yeah. So as Magdalena was going through the wines, uh, a couple things happened, but I made sure to uh, sort of keep some examples here so you can see uh, what happened. Uh, so I did flip the fish just to finish it very quickly. Uh, but if you could see if we can get the overhead shot, I kept one piece uh, unflipped so you can see kind of at what stage uh, we flipped it. Uh, if not, I can bring it over to the front camera. Do you want to do that? So you can start to see um, that the protein is starting to tighten up a little bit. So on the one that's unflipped, uh, you can start to see a little bit of white coming out of the proteins on the side. So that's letting you know that the proteins are cooking. Anytime you're cooking uh, salmon or trout or something like that. Uh, and then you can see like these are super, super crisp, uh, golden brown. Um, and yeah. So from there, what we're gonna do is use the same pan, because again, we wanna pick up those same flavors, just like that perfect bite in the sandwich or wrap. And we're gonna use um, the pan to, uh, the romaine to sort of pick up those flavors. So you can either use uh, conventional uh, romaine that you can get from maybe the grocery store full size. Uh, we got more artisanal kind of uh, uh, local lettuces that you can uh, get. So that you can get baby jam lettuce, um, which is sort of our favorite. That's what we use at the restaurant uh, all season long. But uh, yeah, so once the fish came out of the pan, this stayed hot. And then I don't know if you can hear that crackle happening. Uh, but yeah, that's the moisture hitting the pan um, from the heat. So we're going to start sauteing this. And really what we want to do, maybe pick up a little bit of color, but mainly just wilt it, soften it a little bit, have some of the moisture come out. And then we can dress it with our garish sauce. And then it kind of replicates that in the nicest way of saying like a, a soggy Caesar salad or something like that, or an overdressed Caesar salad. Uh, but we're doing that by again, sort of wilting it down. Um, if there's any chefs sort of on the uh, on the call here, I know that like grilled romaine happened maybe like 10 years ago and should have stopped. But I mean, I like the flavor of it. So we're gonna keep doing it, I guess. But uh, it was a very sort of 2000s, 2010 kind of thing. But, um, but this is sort of the perfect uh, replication for for that bite. You know, when you're when you're having that sandwich and you're really sad that it's done, but then you look into the wrapper and then there's that little bite that you can sort of grab your fingers and then uh, and enjoy. It. But um, but yeah, this isn't gonna take very long at all. Again, I'm doing everything with my hands, but I'm sure totally fine uh, with a spatula. So again, it's picking up. 
some caramelization, actually very, very quickly, uh, super, super wilty. And I didn't season it beforehand uh, because if you ever tried seasoning, uh, you know, dry lettuce, it's just going to bounce right off of it. So I'm going to wait till it wilts down a little bit, pick, let some of the moisture come out, and then seasoning will stick to it really, really well. Uh, and then it's pretty much done. I just flipped it over just to give the other side, essentially the, the more, uh, the rougher side, uh, the root side, to soften up a little bit. But some of these softer guys are already done. We do want it to have a little bit of bite to it. Uh, so this is going to get flat. I'm going to take the small ones out first. And maybe we'll go past it. Big small, big small. And then what I'm going to do is just top it off with the grabiche on top. Nice little dollop for each of uh, the grilled romaine there. Each piece gets a nice topping. And then we're going to pop the trout on top, shave a little bit of a hard cheese. So we have a sheep's milk toscana, but you can always do like a parmesan or a pecorino, something really nice and peppery. And basically what we're going to do is just plate the trout as well like so. Um, and then we also have the hard cheese here. So this is the sheep's milk Toscana, local to Ontario. Mm. And as you can see, it's a very, very loose interpretation of a Florida dish, but for the most part has the, the same components of it. Uh, but yeah. Nice little garnish here. We have some dill as well. That's about it. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. I know um, we were pretty ambitious, so we have stretched out mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's been, it's, I think it was a lot packed in, into this time. So, uh, and there were a lot of good questions and it's hard not to want to answer those for people. So, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a great evening. I know that I always learn from these types of things, little tips, big tips. Um, and also from this one, I would say lots of things that are easier than you think. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm yeah, not I sure. One thing. I did bring this pan back out. So please follow us on Ricky and Olivia, R-I-C-K-Y and Olivia. I'm going to light the Saganaki on fire and we'll put it on our Instagram and then you can see how it's done <laughs> properly. Hell or high water is going to happen, but uh, okay. please follow us on Instagram and stay tuned for that because it's going to happen. Okay, wonderful. I will watch and learn and uh yeah sorry about that um thanks everyone for staying on thank you arlene and thank you mark for being patient i us under assume you're the next guest <laughs> actually you know i think it was very interesting because mark was actually watching and texting me in the background and ricky and olivia i don't know if you know mark best but he's a good friend of mine mark do you guys have well, actually met yeah 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 so so you actually all know each other <laughs> Wonderful. And this what's really fun. brilliant about this is Mark is actually joining us from tomorrow <laughs> in Australia, in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> How's tomorrow, Mark? Yeah. It's tomorrow is great. Nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, and you know what? It's such a brilliant thing. And you were sending me some texts about how brilliant you thought that they were doing. So I, I appreciate that as someone who's a veteran yeah. in the I enjoyed it. Industry. Thank you. Oh, thank That's you. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll watch this session, but I guess I just have to take myself off. Is that right? All right. So everyone who joined us ourselves? and Ricky and Olivia, thank you so much for It's enjoying. getting serious now. There's been enough frivolity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Too much frivolity. <laughs>